Welcome everyone. I'm Jesse Burst. I'm with the Smart Cities Council. I'll be your moderator today as we talk about performance, excellence, and electricity renewal, the PEER program. And as you'll see, this is a very valuable tool for today's electricity world. You know, utilities everywhere are under pressure to change. Maybe change isn't even the strong enough word to transform. Pressure from management, maybe, or from policymakers, or from regulators, or from ratepayers, or from advocacy groups, or all of the above. And we're moving to a very different world. You know, where power generation is going to be much more distributed, where renewables are going to be a much higher percentage, where not just the technical and system aspects are changing, but the business models are changing, and the customer relationship is changing. And in the midst of all of that, how do you know? where you stand, where you're weak and strong. How do you set your priorities? And then as you work to make these changes, how do you know what's working and what's not? How do you measure uh, your progress? And how do you show that progress you know, to your constituents? How do you demonstrate to regulators and ratepayers and, and management that you're on track? So we're going to talk about a tool that can help with many of those issues. And uh, today in particular, we're going to focus on how this tool can help you assess and improve resiliency. So here's our here's our lineup today. We're going to start off and talk a little bit about why this uh, tool is valuable. We'll take you quickly through the fundamentals and then we're going to drill down into these important topics about resiliency, microgrids, critical infrastructure, and other ways to, to improve reliability. So here to help us, we've got uh, Troy Miller with S&C Electric and also uh, Ryan Franks with uh, U.S. Green Building Council. And you'll, you'll notice that when she built this slide, my assistant wisely chose not to show my picture, so I think we can all be thankful for that. So let's get started, please, and let's bring on Troy Miller with S&C Electric. He's got a couple of decades in power engineering with a real emphasis on power quality and power electronics. So Troy, uh, thanks for taking the time today. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Jesse. So as Jesse already mentioned, the electric supply model is changing. Customers are installing distributed generation. Really, the future is already here in many states and cities. We've got 40% renewable penetration in some places like Southern California, in Hawaii, in South Australia, near Adelaide, and others. The other thing that you get when you install distributed generation is the ability to create a microgrid. And microgrids are really seen as antidotes to the reliability issues of the current state of the US and world grid. Customers are demanding much better performance from their grid, and they're turning to microgrids to, to provide that. One thing that a microgrid needs in the 21st century, and really the grid needs for, the, for, for its overall stability, is energy storage. Energy storage can manage the unpredictable two-way power flows that come with distributed generation on the line, as well as it improves reliability needed by those today's loads and mission-critical applications. We're going to take a look at some of those later on in the slide deck. Energy storage can address localized capacity constraints, as recently evidenced by the Aliso Canyon gas leak. Southern California Edison is very concerned that they may run into blackout situations and has ordered an emergency procurement of at least 50 and up to 200 megawatts of energy storage for four hours to address these problems as you retire. Traditional spinning assets and nuclear and coal generation goes the way of the old school. It becomes a very big stabilizing ingredient in microgrids as well. So energy storage offers voltage source for distributed generation synchronization. If you are islanding, and like we're going to talk about with a microgrid, and you don't have something to provide the voltage reference, your photovoltaic won't work. Many homeowners have put photovoltaics on their roof and not included energy storage along with it. And when the grid goes away or there's a blackout situation, they're very perplexed as to why their PV won't operate. Storage also can smooth these intermittent renewables and fill in gaps that, uh, that cause havoc on the overall grid and can also extend the day and time shift that renewable energy to give you a bigger footprint of carbon neutral generation. 
So microgrids based on distributed generation require fast intelligent switching. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, later on, as well as distributed automation to balance the loads that are available and prioritize those loads into critical and non-critical and match the available generation. So thank you, Troy. We just heard Troy Miller with SNC Electric talking about why this new world we're moving into and why peer tools is so needed and so useful. So now let's talk a little bit about the fundamentals. And for that, let's ask Ryan Franks to step in. Ryan's with the U.S. Green Building Council. He leads the development of the technical and business aspects of PEER. So, Ryan, uh, thank you and welcome. Well, thank you very much, Jesse. Uh, yes, I'm happy to be here, and uh, thanks, Troy, for, for kicking us off there. So, yeah, we're talking about PEER here. PEER is uh, Performance Excellence in Electricity Renewal, and it's really the first dynamic adaptive rating process for electric power system performance. Uh, if you're familiar with LEED, it's a parallel to that, only for electric power systems. Now, PEER was developed with a lot of stakeholder engagement, and really it covers four categories and 68 different performance criteria. But today, uh, we'd like to focus on just one, uh, and that is reliability and resiliency. The, the four categories, though, uh, just to recap, if you've attended another of these uh, Smart Cities webinars, the categories are reliability and resiliency, energy efficiency and environment, operational effectiveness, and the customer contribution. Now, Troy was talking about a lot of strategies that can increase reliability and resiliency for electricity. And why PEER is such a powerful tool is that we've never had an agreement on how to measure reliability and resiliency until now with PEER. Jumping into the, the criteria, there's three different types of criteria, prerequisites, core, and bonus criteria. Prerequisite criteria are things that have to be in place in order to become PEER certified. And those criteria include AMI, advanced meters, uh, having a communications backbone, having SCADA or supervisory control and data acquisition, having an emergency response plan in place, and having a safety review process for any design changes that you make to your electric power system. Now this gets certainly a little nerdy for the non power system professional, but it's very important to be able to quantify how often and how long you have outages for. And there's a variety of indices that accomplish this. So tracking these various industries is part of the core criteria for PEER, We're talking about SADI or System Average Interruption Duration Index, safety for frequency, how often you have outages, how often you have interruptions lasting longer than five hours with CLID, if you have a damage and exposure prevention plan, and whether or not you have alternative sources of electricity supply. If you have an outage going one way, can you supply it going the other way? It's important to note here as well that in a lot of these indices where you're tracking interruptions, many of the regulatory agencies and utilities report these numbers with a little bit of ambiguity. And PEER removes that ambiguity because we do not allow for major event days and major events like say a hurricane to be taken away. Usually in, a, in the regulatory environment, the clock stops when there is a, a very large outage, but that, of course, skews the numbers and appears to make many power systems look more robust than they are. But continuing with the core criteria here, distribution redundancy and automated restoration, uh, whether or not there's the capability to island, uh, which clearly dovetails, of course, with uh, what Trey was talking about with microgrids. Uh, having power surety for critical loads and identifying those critical loads, things that are absolutely necessary as you recover from events, power resiliency through recovery, mitigation of common risks and threats, and also the infrequent risks and threats. Uh, having an idea and going through the peer process allows you to holistically look at what might affect your power quality and your outage uh, frequency and duration. And then finally, the bonus criteria, tracking things like momentary interruptions with MAFI, tracking multiple momentary interruptions, the interruption frequency, uh, whether or not there's the, the ability to measure power quality, which is becoming increasingly important with things like uh, hospitals, uh, data centers, high-tech manufacturing, and finally, an innovation category for things that we may not have considered but certainly should be taken into account in terms of increasing the resiliency and reliability of an electric power system. So thanks, Ryan. So we just heard from Ryan Franks of U.S. Green Building Council on the fundamentals of the peer program. So let's drill down now into microgrid strategies 
that piece of the whole story. And for that, let's bring back Troy Miller with SNC Electric. Troy? Thanks again, Jesse. Now we're going to talk about some uh, interesting strategies and also some great examples of how microgrids have been already improving reliability and resiliency for utilities and large CNI customers. For utilities, the most important thing, like Ryan was talking about, is reduction in SADI, SAFI, and MAFI indexes, which are interruption measures. The sustained interruptions as well as momentary interruptions and that's how they're measured by their local PUCs for how they're performing and it can affect their ability to get rate increases. So dynamic islanding. This is very important if you're looking with mission critical applications. You do not want to have a sustained outage. If there is an outage, you quickly switch over without much interruption to your alternate form of generation, which can include PV, microturbines, storage, fuel cells, and the like. So this is done via a patented droop algorithm, which is a fancy way of saying one voltage sits right underneath the grid voltage, so there isn't any interruption as, one, as the grid goes away. It also can provide frequency regulation and sophisticated diesel integration. This is a way of saying that we're attempting in islanded situations, true islanded remote communities and islands that are running their microgrids fully off of diesel. You're able to mitigate that use of diesel and use the alternate forms of generation first. And it also can do peak shaving for demand reduction in large CNI customers as well. So you're using your alternate generation uh, to, to reduce your demand charges as well as shift some of your peak energy to your off-peak. So like I said, if you're going to attempt to have a mission critical or a very sensitive piece of electronics connected to the microgrid, you need to create that island very quickly. One of the things that people often forget is that you have to coordinate your faults differently in a microgrid situation when compared to the overall grid. There's not as much short circuit current available in an island situation, so you have to adjust your fault protection to account for that. Talked about this earlier, load sharing and load shedding. Basically, you're trying to prioritize your critical applications first, your less sensitive application second to match the available generation. And then it's also available to do voltage and frequency control to keep everything organized and running properly. This is a very exciting project that we recently completed in Minster, Ohio. It's an energy storage plant that happens to be co-located with 4.8 megawatts of photovoltaic. The population of this town is only 2,800 pretty forward-looking. They're trying to re reduce their coal dependency in traditional generation. They're offsetting about a third of their overall sustained load by putting in that 4.8 megawatts of PV. And at the same time, they're using this energy storage plant to participate in the frequency regulation market, provide voltage support and bar compensation, and uh, manage their demand charges. We're in conversations now to upgrade this to include intelligent switching as well as an islanding switch to provide a microgrid for some of the critical loads in this city. This is a pretty famous microgrid that was completed back in 2012. It was backboned by a 2 megawatt, 4 megawatt hour energy storage system. It has 3 megawatts of PV some small wind, a one megawatt fuel cell, and several diesel generators. And in the past, when there would be an outage at PG&E, the Santa Rita jail would go dark for about 10 seconds, which is a long time if you happen to be a guard. So they have up, received some funding to put in this microgrid, and now they have continuity of power throughout the day, and they're also able to reduce their bill from pg e by demand charge reduction and shifting peak to off-peak. Right. Uh, this is Jesse. Let me just uh, break in for sure. a second. We have a question Please. from Sarah who wants to know, uh, does integrating diesel create new emissions concerns, or is it at a negligible scale compared to traditional non-microgrid generation, coal and so, so on? 
So typically, if you're if you're working with a place like Santa Rita Jail, they'll have the diesels there already, or the Encore microgrid that we've talked about in the past in some of these. There's traditionally ge diesel generation on site, and your the idea is to use that as the generation of last resort. Mm -hmm. So you use up all the other forms of uh, alternative energy first, and then move into the diesel generation if there's if if all the others are exhausted. So. so I hear you saying it would actually mitigate the emissions. That's uh, correct. Concerns. Yeah, right. terrific. You're attempting to use it as a last resort, so it does mitigate pretty significantly the, the diesel emissions. Thanks, Troy. No problem. So here we're looking at a microgrid that was created in Field, British Columbia. Field, British Columbia is a town of about 300 people that's served by a radially fed 70-mile line. They had outages very, very frequently and they would sometimes last up to 6 to 24 hours. The outages were cr created because if there was an outage, the line was actually served through a protected forest, so they couldn't trim the trees to be able to prevent some of those outages, and when the outage came, they had to coordinate with the railroad because the line ran right along the railroad as well, so the outages would last longer than you would expect. So S&C, back in 2012, put in with BC Hydro a 1 megawatt, 7 megawatt hour system to uh, automatically island in the case of an outage. We'll take a look at the next slide for a very good example of community engagement. The people of Field British Columbia wanted to know when they were on battery and BC Hydro had to think of a way to come up with to tell them where the battery was in its state of charge. So they created a Twitter account, and for those of you on Twitter, you may go to field outage status to see the status of the battery, whether or not they're on battery backup, and if they continue to use their loads at that rate, this is how long the battery will last. So what the interesting thing that they found is that because the people are so used to having these 24-hour outages, they want the battery to last as long as possible. So they actually start to conserve in their homes to extend out the time that the battery can run. So you'll see it in the beginning of this tweet. It'll say seven hours, then it'll move to 12, and then eventually to 18. So it's a pretty interesting community engagement for these types of microgrids. You can see here how this particular microgrid has been able to improve the performance of this particular small town in British Columbia. Over the course of less than one year, about 11 months, they had 80 hours of outages prevented. Vehicle accidents, trees, coordination, highway closures. So 80 hours of outages prevented. So this drastically decreases the SADI, the SAFI, and the MAFI numbers for BC Hydro. And just one poorly performing feeder can really affect your overall numbers for a utility or a muni or a city. So there are microgrids that have been in operation for even longer. Some large batteries, some examples for AEP that we've done. There are an island size of 25 customers that was actually islanded for two days. Somebody hit a pole, the pole went down, and they created a sectionalized via the advanced distribution automation and pulled back up a small amount of customers 25 customers, but they were able to keep alive on the battery for two full days. You can see also there was a 700 customer, 77 minute and 800 kilowatt vehicle outage as well. This is another example of an entire town that was islanded using a battery. This one is a lot bigger, 4 megawatt, 24 megawatt hours. Again, islanded automatically if there's an outage, and once the battery then depletes itself, if it's not corrected in that six-hour time frame, it goes to the alternate utility source or the Mexican utility, CFE, as the backup. Unfortunately, the U.S. grid and the Mexican grid are not exactly in phase, so the power electronics associated with the battery has to perform this phase shift before it connects up to that alternate source. San Diego Gas and Electric has been putting in microgrid type applications in Borrego Springs, which is about two hours outside of San Diego in the desert. And this particular unit is a CES, which is 25 kilowatts and two hours worth of battery. Pardon, this is Jesse again. Um, sure. I see you're about to talk about solar. 
But yep. uh, Jordan asks if you could just quickly speak to the effectiveness of using natural gas fuel cells instead of diesel generators for microgrids. Any experience with that? So we've got a little bit of experience with using natural gas fuel cells. Um, the Santa Rita jail had a one megawatt fuel cell. Mm -hmm. The only drawback really to fuel cells is they don't like large changes in their power output. Mm -hmm. So if it's a one megawatt fuel cell, it would like to ramp to one megawatt and stay there. So if you have a dynamic load that's moving around and that's the only source of generation, and it becomes somewhat problematic. So it likes to be a constant output. But it is a, it's, and the, the costs are a little bit higher than diesel generation, right? You can imagine. Thank you. No problem. So again, this is an example of a energy storage system co-located with PV, and that PV was about equal to the load on the secondary side. Roughly seven kilowatts of PV, seven kilowatts of load along with a 25 kilowatt hour battery. We were able to have an islanding situation with only two hours worth of battery that we were able to island for 25 hours. So that says that you don't necessarily need a long duration battery to be able to island if you have good solar, wind, or other alternative energy resources. So you can see here on the graph, we had the power outage that lasted that 25 hours. The storage handled the entire load when the sun was down. And just as the battery was about fully depleted, the sun came up and started to recharge the battery as well as all the load. Oh, well, thank you, Troy. Uh, very helpful. It's so great to see these uh, real world examples and be reminded that it's actually happening and you can do it now. So uh, we've been talking uh, a little bit about microgrids. I'm Jesse Burst with the Smart Cities Council, and we're talking about the PEER program. We just heard about how it applies to microgrids. Let's turn now to a very important topic of protecting critical infrastructure. And for that, let's get Ryan Franks of U.S. Green Building Council back with us. Ryan? Thank you. So. Indeed, what Trey was talking about are some very powerful examples that affect hundreds, thousands of people in some instances. And diving into the peer categories, uh, what, taking that at, to a level of abstraction, uh, you know, what, what are we really talking about and how do you gain points in the peer system uh, by working with someone like SNC? Uh, right here, you'll see a bit of load on your right and some generation sources on your left. And this is you know, a simple schematic, but it, it demonstrates the power where, uh, of alternative supply, and that if there's an outage from the primary or one of the alternative sources going to a substation or going out to load, that alternative generation can indeed come back uh, and, and serve the load just fine. So distribution redundancy and auto restoration is another peer category. Uh, it's the ability to provide electricity to loads through multiple paths. Uh, right here, you'll see and if there's an outage, you, you have these, these uh, smart switches, indeed, uh, that can provide automatic restoration, uh, limiting what might be a huge outage to a more uh, minor outage. Uh, another strategy for accomplishing this uh, is distribution redundancy. Uh, with the project in British Columbia that Trev was talking about, he mentioned uh, radial distribution. And indeed, that's what a lot of places have. Uh, some more forward-thinking places are beginning to provide looped uh, distribution circuits, which can, as you can see with the connection on the right, enable electricity to flow in, in this instance, for example, counterclockwise or clockwise uh, through to these various loads. So one of the more powerful things, just to reiterate it here, is the smart sectionalizing switches. Uh, if you have an outage you see there, uh, you know, typically this might affect eight loads, if you see here, eight, eight buildings, eight houses, whatever it may be, eight manufacturing plants. But with this very fast uh, smart sexualizing switching technology, you're able to limit those outages to just a handful and reduce your, your um, all, all the categories that play into peer, all the duration and, and frequency outage indices. Now, this is a very powerful video. On, uh, what, what you see here is, uh, City of Chattanooga and uh, the Electric Power Board EPB of Chattanooga, a very forward-thinking utility, and they've employed these strategies 
with partners like uh, uh, SNC. And what you'll see here is you have a, an ice storm that occurred in February of 2013. And as you move through time, you see the outages, which are in red, pop up, and then the purple come right back into play. And that's due to the strategy with the looped circuits, so the smart sectionalizing switches, and the alternative supply of electricity. And what would have been in their previous history a multi-day, very severe interruption, because they get ice storms uh, frequently and they're, they're bad, uh, becomes a very minor problem. You have very momentary interruptions, and it's just a huge improvement and a very powerful demonstration about how things can go out and come right back online with these technologies. But there's also several things, of course, that are less, less technologically advanced but certainly cause power outages. The vast majority of momentary interruptions, in fact, uh, at least in the U.S., are due to squirrels, particularly, and animals. But uh, by enclosing your infrastructure, uh, doing undergrounding distribution infrastructure to prevent storm outages, uh, providing animal guards, providing crash barriers, uh, providing abrasion protectors and fire coating, you can mitigate a lot of outages. You saw in, I think it was the uh, BC, uh, British Columbia example from Troy, there was a list of outages. And that you never, you might not realize it, of course, but Certainly, if a car runs into a pole and it was in that table uh, once or twice of, of a vehicle crash interrupting uh, electricity service, uh, if you can protect against that and come up with a plan, which is what PEER forces you to do, you can certainly improve your electricity supply dramatically. So thanks, uh, Ryan. We just heard Ryan Franks of U.S. Green Building Council about protecting critical infrastructure and how the PEER system can help you spot those opportunities. Let's talk now about how microgrids can improve reliability. And for that, let's bring back uh, SNC Electric's Troy Miller. Troy? Thank you, Jesse. So yeah, just a couple of slides to illustrate what I was talking about previously. If you're going to use the automated switching uh, that Brian was speaking about, as well as alternative forms of generation, which include energy storage, you're able to greatly reduce your SADI, SAFI, and MAFI numbers, which again are the indices the utility industry uses for their measures of how reliable and resilient their systems are. Uh, so these are some studies that we looked at for a large investor-owned utility, where we studied six poorly performing feeders. Again, these are radially fed uh, without distributed automation. If you're going to put in this along with storage, you can see the percent improvement, anywhere from 20 to 50 percent improvement in these indices, SADI, SAFI, and NAFI, across all these feeders. So it's a very valuable tool for improving your uh, resiliency, reliability, and your peer score. So again, just to recap on microgrids, you're going to have distributed generation, um, advanced switching, and load shedding. And when you have energy storage, you're able to expend the day and use that microgrid in, in all, um, all types of islanding situations. You get DG, distributed generation synchronization. You can load share and load shed. You've got voltage and frequency control, and you're able to shift and smooth uh, those renewable generation assets. And, and overall, you're able to increase your reliability and resiliency of your city, your utility, or your muni. Oh, thanks, uh, Troy. So, so, so far this webinar has been packed with a lot of great real-world examples. To wrap things up, let's look ahead and let's get a sense of the long-term potential for PEER. And for that, uh, let's turn again to Ryan Franks from the U.S. Green Building Council. Would you help us out here, Ryan? Yes, yes, thank you. So in addition to the peer criteria, which can obviously go and help you form a plan for how to improve your electric power system, uh, there's a number of uh, very, very powerful tools that come with peer, including a reliability simulator. You'll see here that it provides some inputs, uh, your, your SADI, your average system availability, your safety, your frequency indices. And you can run through and play with different scenarios uh, case one and case two will illustrate this and how you get a return on your investment, how to optimize your improvements, where to put money where it might matter. You know, does undergrounding uh, to a certain percent increase your reliability more than another strategy, more than uh, 
automatic smart sectionalizing switches. Uh, you know, what, what are the improvements? And you can play around with that and really optimize uh, your improvement path. So going further into some of the criteria here and how you consider uh, what improvements you might make, uh, power surety to critical loads is a peer criteria. Uh, it's the ability to provide power to support critical loads necessary for safety, uh, mission critical loads, and the immediate recovery operations. And on the surface, this might seem obvious, but going through it leads to a lot of question for some cities, for some campuses, about what are truly your critical loads. In a building, this might include elevators, life support devices, emergency lighting in a more infrastructure sense. Uh, this include data centers, chemical processing plants, assembly lines, uh, research and testing facilities. And when you go through and consider what might actually be critical, you lead to some surprising conclusions. I mean, is the, if you have an army base, for example, uh, with a fast food restaurant inside of it, and that's one of the only sources of food, but you have mission critical personnel in it, is that fast food restaurant cr a critical load in order to support the mission, or is it not? But Whatever the case and conclusion may be, PEER allows you to go through and consider this in a very well-rounded sense. Power resiliency through recovery. So reliability is, is one thing. Resiliency and the ability to restore uh, functionality and electricity service is another. Resiliency is, is about the ability to provide long-term power for safety and essential services. And going through the PEER system, if you go through and engage with us, You'll look to identify what loads uh, might be necessary for daily recovery. Look at how much, look at having three weeks of fuel supply for your essential services, things, uh, you know, maybe you're connected to natural gas, but maybe you need uh, three weeks of, of diesel supply on hand for certain services. In a city sense, which is important for this audience, of course, uh, essential services uh, can include a number of things, but police and fire, emergency services, uh, medical facilities, water and wastewater services, and uh, groceries, pharmacies, and the like. So going through and, and considering a little bit further power surety and resiliency, you'll look to have a table like this where you can consider what, what is important both for critical immediate services as well as getting back to normal operations if there is a long duration event. So you'll look at things like technology capabilities. Do you have uh, UPS, interrupted power supply? energy storage, diesel generation on site. For resiliency, you're going to want to consider strategies like uh, natural gas, uh, turbines, solar and storage combinations that can allow you to operate with, with an unimpeded fuel source. Having three weeks of fuel is, of course, not really critical for immediate functionality, but it becomes very, very important for things in the long term as you recover from an event. Going through and looking at your power system hardening is, is important for both of these functions. And the key differentiation here is that it's, it's separating out the components of reliability and resiliency for immediate mitigation of outages versus recovering from an outage event. Islanding capability. So islanding is not required by the, by the peer certification system, but it is part of the core criteria and it is becoming an increasingly valuable uh, technology for power surety. So you see here, the islanding, as, as Troy was alluding to, you, you can see here a, uh, a microgrid schematic, a one-line diagram, where you might have up at the top there supply from a substation, uh, maybe there's an outage, a storm, and it can switch over immediately to the localized generation, providing just a momentary outage. This is a very new concept for a lot of the systems. Uh, certainly, there's there's been microgrids employed in military bases and many other facilities for for decades, but there's a, a very immediate focus in our in our society about uh, preventing outages, and this is a, a very powerful way to do that. So mitigation of common risks and threats, and then we'll get to infrequent uh, risks and threats. But peer again is not it, it, it's a means to an end. It's not that no one is getting a peer score just to have a peer score, but they're getting a peer score and going through the process in order to think through what challenges and what opportunities there are for power system improvement. So you can generate a, a picture of what your outages are from uh, weather damage and other types of uh, outages, which are typically in the type of short duration events. But then again, there's a lot of things that you may not 
think about what is the risk to fire in your city's electrical power system? What is the risk from flooding? What if there is in this day and age a terrorist attack, whether it's domestic or international? Uh, what equipment failures are likely? So here again, is, this is a simplified view, but it's going through and looking uh, very carefully about what is the potential for outage and how do we invest and come up with the best plan to mitigate those, those failures. So another one of these tools, in addition to the actual peer criteria, is a failure modes and effects analysis, FMEA. And this, building off of what I said earlier, is looking at each individual component of your electric power system and trying to identify all the possible failures, everything that could go wrong, and then prioritizing what effect that would have on your electric power system reliability and resiliency, and then mitigating starting at the most extreme events. You can create a heat map of where things are likely to go off track and then knock those out. So indeed, how do you use PEER? It's painless. You can get in contact with uh, Troy or myself and we'll have our contact information up here in a second. But there's three ways to get engaged. Uh, if you're an engineering firm, you can engage with us in a partnership where you can go work with projects that are either in the planning stage or uh, already completed to become peer certified. If you're a facility owner or a campus microgrid owner or a municipal utility, you can engage with, engage, uh, with us in participation where you can gain access to a wealth of educational materials as well as these tools, these workbooks that I was talking about in order to uh, employ a peer in your design strategies. And finally, Education for anybody really, but we have a number of educational resources on the electric power system, not just a peer tool essentially, but the electric power system and uh, considerations and design and, and operation of it, uh, which you can en engage with and take on our website in order to uh, increase your awareness. So I would encourage you, there's, there's a wealth of information at the, the website there, peer.gbci.org. I would encourage you to go visit there, especially the resources tab, and take a look at what we're talking about. And by the very nature of your attendance at this webinar, it demonstrates that you have an interest in reliability and resiliency of electric power systems of your, your city's critical infrastructure. So regardless of who you are, an engineering firm, someone completely unrelated to electricity, uh, or a municipal leader, really you should get in contact with us. So this is Jesse Burst of the Smart Cities Council, and on behalf of the council and on behalf of our listeners today, thank you to Ryan Franks of U.S. Green Building Council. Thank you to Troy Miller from s and Electric. Special thank you to Dahlia Collada from s and Electric for pulling all of this together. And thanks to all of you for joining us today and also for your interest in strengthening the electric power system that we all depend on. We all depend on. We all depend on. We all depend on. We all depend on.